Welcome back to Robot Cantina. Time to get that burger or hot dog off the grill, grab an adult beverage, and stay away from that fruit salad your Aunt Betty brought. By the way, those aren't raisins in there, and you'll thank me later. Also, on this Memorial Day weekend, let's remember those heroes who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Today we're going to push this car to the limit once again, but before we do that, we have to do some minor repairs to the top half of the engine. Next, we'll modify the torque converter clutch, and finally, we're going to install an air-to-air -air intercooler to lower the temperatures after the air is compressed by the supercharger. Will these modifications be enough to get our street-legal go-kart up to 70 miles per hour? Well, stick around and find out. So as most of you folks know, at the end of the previous video, we took the car out for a road test and unfortunately we popped a head gasket. On an air-cooled engine, blowing a head gasket's not the end of the world. Most of the time the engine will still run and there is of course no danger of the oil being contaminated by the cooling system because, well, it's an air-cooled engine. Anyway, we managed to carefully limp the car back to the workshop for repairs. Well, the obvious reason the gasket blew is from the glorious boost from the stupid charger. I guess this is to be expected. Anyway, let's have a look at the damage. Before using the impact driver to remove the head bolts, I pre-loosened the bolts with a regular ratchet. Now this is interesting, not all the head bolts seem tight. Let's get a look at that gasket. Well, this gasket is definitely blown in several places. Looks like the fire ring was breached and it burned right through the fiber section. This is obviously the worst of the damage, but we do see other parts of the gasket that were in the process of failing. Now I have to admit this gasket was part of a low budget kit and it's hard to say if this cheapo gasket was pushed too hard and perhaps a better gasket would have tolerated the boost better. The head has a decent burn mark, but it doesn't seem too deep and it should clean up. The casting marks on the head are deceiving and look like cracks, but that's just an optical illusion. Looks like something's going on over here. Hard to say what that's all about, but it doesn't look good. So this is the Hemi version of the 420 Predator engine, and here we can clearly see the hemispherical combustion chamber. Now the word Hemi is often associated with Chrysler products, but the Hemi head has been around since the early 1900s and originated in Europe. The burn marks on the block are superficial, but I think the next time the gasket blows, we'll tow the car back to the workshop. I think the only reason the engine ran as good as it did was because the stupid charger was cramming the cylinder full of air, and even though we were losing compression, the boost was helping to make up for it. So both the block and the head cleaned up well, and neither showed signs of damage like cracks or warping. The damage was limited to minor pitting on the surface of the aluminum, so I'm going to give this engine a clean bill of health and slap a new gasket in. Unfortunately, the only gasket we have in stock is yet another cheapo head gasket. <laughs> Let's see how long this one lasts. While we have the engine out, let's take a look at the torque converter clutch and take a stab at tuning it for better acceleration. So this type of clutch uses these composite pucks that slide in and out. And this is what changes the ratios. Now the weight of these pucks determine how soon the torque converter will shift through its ratios. Heavier pucks will cause the clutch to shift faster and lighter pucks will slow down the shifting. The current belief is the torque converter clutch system is shifting through its range way too fast and is not optimized for the engine's power. Now, we've already added extra tension to the driven pulley. Now let's try changing the pucks in the clutch. So these pucks weigh 495 grams, and according to the spec sheet, we're right about here, whatever that means. So we're going to replace the heavy pucks with a set of lighter pucks. Looks like this set weighs in at 235 grams, so let's take a look at the spec sheet. That puts us right about here. Now, this is just a guess, and we may have to revisit the pucks again, but for now, I reckon this is a good starting point. So once the pucks are installed, they're held in place by this big spring. My experience with the Comet 44 Magnum clutch is, they really want to have all the puck positions filled. We certainly could have used less pucks, but in the past when I tried this, the clutch would jam. This clutch was made for a 1 inch diameter shaft, and to reassemble the clutch, we used a short section of 1 inch axle that was securely clamped to a bench vise. The clutch cover threads onto the pulley section by spinning it clockwise, and finally the covers tightened. We're using a homemade tool for this job. I don't believe Comet sells the tools any longer, or they're very hard to get. By the way, this clutch system's rated for 18 horsepower. Hmm, is that going to be enough? With the engine repaired and the clutch modified, it was time to place the engine back in the car. Swapping this engine in and out takes less than an hour on a good day. 
if we can find our tools. The intercooler that we'll be using in our Street Legal go-kart is kind of smallish and it was hard to find with the proper size inlet and outlets. This one took a while to get, but it was cheap at less than 100 bucks. Getting more stuff to fit under the hood of this car is like trying to pack 10 pounds of poop in a 5 pound bag. I would like to have the intercooler behind the bumper and expose it to the airflow in this direction. It's going to be difficult to get it to fit in such a small space. Now, some of you folks are probably yelling at the computer, just cut a hole in the hood! If I had a nickel every time someone said cut a hole in the hood, this channel would be putting lawnmower engines and Lamborghinis instead of 20 year old Honda Insights. Hmm, a Lamborghini 420 Hemi? Of course, we'd have to stupid charge it and put an idiot cooler in it. So if you want to see a Lamborghini or a Ferrari with a lawnmower engine in it, please make sure to subscribe. Believe it or not, if we get enough subscribers, we might actually do that. What about a Porsche? I don't know. They pretty much have a lawnmower engine to begin with, so that wouldn't be too exciting. Okay, so back to our story. While you folks were distracted by my stupid dad jokes, I managed to slip the intercooler into the Honda and made all the necessary connections. Yeah, it looks the same as it did before, but hidden somewhere behind that bumper is the intercooler. No, really. Let's take a look at the intercooler and the plumbing before we installed it in the car. So as you can see, this thing snakes through the car at odd angles and curves, but it does manage to fit quite well. There's absolutely no room left under the hood to fit all this stuff in. Of course, this is an air-to-air -air intercooler. We had a look at a liquid-to-air intercooler, and not only would it not fit, it also required more stuff to make it work. Anyway, by some miracle we got all the plumbing to fit, and still leave room to put fuel in the tiny fuel tank. Yeah, we're still running the little one gallon fuel tank, but not for much longer. Now, if we can get this car to run long enough, we may do a fuel economy run on it. I think the last time we checked, the car got something like 45 miles to the gallon. But keep in mind, this is a full-on race car and not your typical grocery getter. <laughs> Let's see if this thing still runs. Well, I reckon that ain't bad. It starts and sounds pretty good. The intake air temperature is sitting at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's no surprise because we just started the engine. Let's let the engine idle for 20 minutes and see if the intercooler is doing its job. We get new viewers every week, and this story is sometimes hard to follow if this is your first time visiting the channel. So the purpose of this project is to get this little car to go 70 miles per hour on a single cylinder 420 cc engine from a cement mixer. Oh yeah, we're aware that there are much better engines we could have used, but the fun of this challenge is to accomplish our goal the hard way. Ah, it's been raining the past few days, and we're itching to take this car out for a road test. I reckon we will soon. After 20 minutes of idling, normally we can expect the air intake temperature to slowly increase to just under 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, today with the addition of the intercooler, we can see that the temperature only got to 79 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's without any air blowing on the intercooler. Once the car is moving, the intake air temperature should be at or just a few ticks above ambient. I'm thinking the intercooler is definitely working, and we pretty much have solved the hot air problem. Well, the rain finally stopped. I think it's time to hit the road. Right away I can tell the clutch is too loose and not dialed in correctly. The little engine's bouncing off the rev limiter every time we give it the beans. For now, we really have to ease in on the throttle to get the car to move. I guess we'll need to add some heavier pucks to the clutch.
After a bit of fooling around, it was time to go for a full send and find out just how fast this car will go. Keep in mind, we're still running a very conservative tune and the clutch is slipping like hell. Go ahead and keep an eye on the speedometer. I know it's hard to see and sometimes it's completely washed out by the sunlight. Sixty six miles per hour. Technically, that's a new record, but we ain't stopping there. Sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine. Nice. Seventy, And that's it, folks. We did it. Now, previously, somebody in the comment section said that it would take 30 horsepower to get to 70 miles per hour. I'm not sure how true that is, but at the very least, we definitely doubled the power on this little 13 horsepower engine. Alright, well that was the most exciting ride of my life. Yeah, I know it was only 70 miles per hour, but we did it with a cement mixer engine and determination. Let's do the list, just for fun. We did it in a water-cooled supercharger, twin throttle body, intercooled, fuel injected, 420cc Hemi BIG BLOCK from a cement mixer in a wee little Honda Insight. Well, the good news is the engine survived unscathed, but we did uncover some problems. The first one is obviously someone configured the clutch a bit on the loose side. Let's take a quick look at a data log snapshot. Well, first of all, this green line is the intake air temperature after the intercooler. This snapshot was taken after about 30 minutes of road testing. Meh. The intake temp never got much above ambient, and that's with the hood on the car. So that's kind of a secondary achievement for today. The yellow trace is the throttle position, and as you can see, we couldn't get into the throttle too much. On this acceleration snapshot, we really eased into the throttle and managed about 60% before the torque converter clutch got a bite and the car started moving. So then the throttle slowly increased and at this point the engine overpowered the clutch and the RPM ramped up quickly until it bounced off the rev limiter. Anyway, that's certainly not ideal and we need to go back and fiddle some more with the clutch. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, with the loose clutch, we weren't able to record any coherent 0-60 to 60 data. Another problem that cropped up well, let's take a look. So the sputtering you hear is the electronic fuel injection losing sync with the crank position sensor. As you can see here, every time the engine sputters, the data logger records zero RPM. Now the sync errors are sometimes easy to solve, and since this is a recent development, I reckon the crank position sensor may have moved slightly. And we'll need to do some adjusting. Overall, I'm calling a success on the 70 mile per hour goal, but we still need to make a few more tweaks to get the most from this engine. So stay tuned for more epic content. Now keep in mind, we're almost done with the 420 engine, and the next engine we're going to try is the 670 V-twin BIG BIGGER BLOCK. These experiments are obviously for entertainment, 
but there's also a lot of engineering hurdles that we solve and perhaps give ideas to other experimenters. We're able to produce these videos on an extremely tight budget, and the simplest way the viewer can help out is to subscribe and share these videos. The more the audience grows, the more we can afford to do. It's basically how YouTube works. So if you wouldn't mind, now is the time to show your support and click on subscribe. Give us a like and leave a comment. Actually, any kind of comment is a good comment. And one more thing, I want to give a shout out to the episode 13 fan club. You folks are the greatest and we have a season 2 episode 13 coming up real soon. Until next time.